Hey everybody, in today's episode of Trek in Time, we're gonna talk about how to write your way out of a corner. That's right, we're talking about Enterprise, <laughs> season four, episode one, Stormfront, part one. Welcome to Trek in Time, where you should know by now what we're doing. We're watching every episode of Star Trek in chronological order. We're also taking a look at what the world was like at the time of the original broadcast. Who are we? I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matthew. Matthew is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impacts on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? It's a good weekend. How about you? I'm pretty good. I will hold back on some of the comments about how this couple of episodes has made me feel this weekend, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll get into that. But as usual, before we get into the current discussion around this episode, we like to share some previous comments from you, the listeners. So Matt, what have you got for us this time? Well, this time I have not one, but two comments from Pale Ghost. Mm. And I want to read them both because very interesting insights. Uh, the first one was, so am I weird that I expect most people to know some form of martial arts in Star Trek? It's so mm. weird that these are highly trained people who are supposed to be ready for almost anything they come across, but they throw punches like a middle schooler in their first fight. <laughs> I love that about Worf in Next Generation. Even though he was a punching bag to show the strength of the aliens, he was still training his forms constantly and actually used consistent techniques on attackers from those forms. The Makos do this a little bit, but they throw boxing stances boxing and then there's just a whole bunch of random characters <laughs> what are they going to do robodope an insectoid kidney punch a klingon <laughs> yeah i i wanted to call that one out because i just i loved it because i i have noticed that myself of it's like whatever's convenient like oh we need this character to go down quickly let's just have them do the hacha and then the like the worst like move possible that looks like a school grader fighting yeah and then there's other times where it's like whoa that looks like a little martial arts fight that's happening, which is pretty cool. It seems to be ri no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. The second comment from Pale Coast was, and this is directly related to what we're going to talk about today a little bit. They literally could have cut the Nazi aliens part out and kept it for the cold open on the season premiere. Having the episode start with them returning to Earth, celebrating the destruction of the weapon and mourning Archer, who would have been light flashed by an unknown, would have been so much better. Looking forward to the next season, although I don't think it's a good sign that I can only remember three of the 24 clearly. <laughs> and, yeah. what, and I wanted to call that one out because I agree with him. It's like the fact that they put that alien at the end of the previous episode. We talked about this. It like, I don't say, I don't think it wrecked the episode, but man, it, it was like a the air out of the room. Yeah. It sucked the air yeah. out of the room at the end. It was, it was absolutely necessary. Yeah. yeah. So it's like if they had just moved it, it would have worked. Yeah. Yeah. So, as we've just touched on, we're talking about the first episode of the fourth season, and we're kind of stuck in a bad place just because of the way they left a hook at the end of the previous episode. And listeners who are listening to this podcast in order will remember that in our previous episode, I shared some details of how that came about. And there was a quote from Brandon Braga who said, yeah, they were talking about how to end the episode and he didn't know who said Nazis, but somebody in the room said Nazis and then suddenly it was space Nazis and that's how they ended the episode. And it literally was writing themselves into a corner. So here we are, mm -hmm. episode number one and two, a two-parter of season four starts off with, and this is an interesting note, Berman and Braga took a step back from being showrunners this season. Mm -hmm. The show was moved to Friday nights, not a good sign. There was a lot of debate during the season three. There was a lot of expectation that the show might be canceled. Obviously not a good sign. The fact that the two of them took a step back indicates that they were probably prepping, knowing that this would be the last season. They were probably prepping for whatever their post enterprise career would look like. And the reins were handed over to Manny Cotto. Manny Cotto, now is showrunner, literally has to write his way out of a corner. Yep. For anybody to be handed the showrunner status on a program, it's got to be a big day. 
I mean, you go in, you, you are being told by the executives, yeah, you, you are going to be our person in this seat. You got to be like, hooray. Might what have did been, this guy do on the, what did they do on the way out the door? Yeah. <laughs> might have been mixed feelings at this point for Manny Cotto to be like, yeah. And so the closing shot of season three was what? Oh, a couple of Nazis and one of them is an alien. Okay. So he literally <laughs> has to write, he writes a two parter yep. and he's literally writing himself out of a corner. And the entire setup was this will be concluded in the first episodes. This is not going to be a season long storyline. Fine. So Manny does the best job he can with a bad setup to get us out of space Nazi territory and literally world war two space Nazis. I mean, this is just mm -hmm. like the cherry on top is it is once again, time travel involved like Matt. <laughs> <laughs> there's that alarm going off in the background do you hear that you know what that is <laughs> that's the read alert Just... <laughs> it's time for matt to read the wikipedia description i could, I could tell you were ready to go on a rant <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so the description set in the 22nd century the series follows the adventures of the first starfleet starship enterprise registration nx01 in this episode after destroying the zindi weapon enterprise finds itself in the 20th century during world war ii with nazis in control of the northeastern usa captain archer scott bakula joins silik john fleck to stop the alien nazis okay restore the time i don't want to get spoilers but restore the timeline it's and fine. end the temporal cold war yeah I just paused on the John Fleck call out because he plays such a minor role in these two episodes. It's kind of funny. Yeah. So to call him out, it's kind of, but it is, but. I mean, ultimately I'll save that comment for later. I will. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, yeah. let's wait till we go. Yeah, let's so here we are. <laughs> we are now in October of 2004, October 8th, part one airs. It is directed by Alan Croker. It was written by Manny Cotto. And guest stars include Golden Brooks, who plays Alicia Travers, Jack Waltney, who played Vosk, John Fleck as Silic once again, Matt Winston as Temporal Agent Daniels, a character who apparently can die as many times as the writers want him to, Christopher Neem, German General, Stephen R. Sherpa as Carmine, Mark Elliott Silverberg as Crawl, David Pease as Alien Technician, Burr Middleton as Newsreel Narrator, Joe Maruzzo as Sal, Tom Wright as Garth, J. Paul Bomer as SS Agent, and John Herringal as Joe Pratsky. Lots of guest stars in this, mm -hmm. not a one of whom will ever be seen again. Nope. So the original air date, October 8th, 2004, and Matt... I'm sure you're wondering, what were you tapping your toes to? You'll remember last episode, it was a Maroon 5 song, and we were talking about how it would be the last week for that Maroon 5 song. But here we Good are, one. months later, it's another Maroon 5 song. You were singing right. along to She Will Be Loved. And at the movies, a little movie called Shark Tale earned $47 million. This is an animated shark film with Will Smith, Robert De Niro, and I had zero recollection this movie even existed. There are apparently a million animated movies, and it's kind of a grab bag of stars voicing all of them, and there's too many to remember. So mm -hmm. this is in the same vein as like, well, Finding Nemo is big. Why don't we make a fish movie? and We'll get some big names in, in the appropriate roles and see what happens. And on television, on October 8th, 2004, this is the first week of Enterprise being on Friday nights, which means two things. First, Friday nights are the TV graveyard. They tend to be the programming that is very kid friendly, very family friendly, because people tend to go out on Friday nights and not stay home and watch television. And the other thing is because the overall numbers tend to be lower, Enterprise potentially wouldn't look as weak as it did on Wednesday nights. So we'll see if that bears out on ABC. People were watching eight simple rules. This was the originally John Ritter program. And then it was shifted over to eight simple rules. Once his unfortunate passing removed him from the program, 6 million people were watching that followed by 4.9 million people watching complete savages. Matt, if I had to pay you a thousand dollars to tell me what complete savages was about, would I keep my money? 
You would keep your money. I don't even remember what that show was. On CBS, 8 million people were watching Joan of Arcadia. And on Fox, 2.8 million people were watching The Complex, Malibu. Matt, Ooh. if I had to pay you $1,000 to tell me what The <laughs> Complex is, would I keep my money? <laughs> you sure would, Sean. <laughs> on NBC, on Dateline, it was the second annual Dateline Diet Challenge. Oh, that sounds riveting. Yeah. 7.5 million people, tu- people tuned in for that. On the WB, What I Like About You had 2.9 million viewers. And Grounded for Life had 2.9 million viewers. And how did Enterprise do on UPN? It had mm-hmm. 2.9 million viewers. So apparently, all the networks got together and decided that the bare minimum of viewers would be 2.9 million viewers. Matt, if I had to pay you $1,000 to tell me what I liked about you it was, it was about... Would I keep my money? <laughs> you definitely keep your money, Sean. <laughs> That's a new segment we like to call, Will Sean Keep His Money? <laughs> and in the news on this day, on or about this day, various headlines included the following. Appearing before the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee, Charles Dolfer, head of the Iraq Survey Group, announced that the group had found no evidence Saddam Hussein had produced any weapons of mass destruction since 1991 when the UN sanctions were imposed. This directly contradicted the main argument used by George Bush and his administration for invading Iraq in 2003. This was reported on the BBC and CNN and really kind of put a nail in the coffin of what were we going to find and where were we going to find it. There were ongoing car bombings and insurgent strikes in Iraq. There were continuing areas of fighting, particularly in Fallujah. And so the U.S. was shifting forces toward Fallujah and asking the British government to move some of its forces to fill the void that the U.S. forces would leave behind and put those forces, the British forces, under U.S. command, which created great debates in the U.K. parliament. And the U.S. was now less than a month away from the 2004 presidential election which could only mean one thing, Matt, time for some debates. And in those debates, the first two had taken place, two of three, and John Kerry, the Democratic senator from Massachusetts, had a strong public response in polling afterward, which is just another demonstration that polling means nothing. Nothing. Yep. Now, on to our discussion around this episode. Here we are. We've just now left the events of Zero Hour, where the Zindi weapon has thankfully been destroyed. Earth has worked with a unexpected collection of support from various aliens. Jonathan Archer has had to cross ethical lines that he himself has tried to draw in how he would treat people, how he would treat prisoners, what he would do in the name of his mission, including stealing things and stranding aliens in space torture lots of lots of things took place in season three any of which could have been brought back to be revisited to show character growth and the the challenges of humanity stepping into the larger world of the galaxy and instead we got this we got some space nazis in world (laughs) war ii so we've right out of the gate the, the closing of the previous episode, the Enterprise returns to Earth to find that they can't find any contact from Starfleet. There's no lunar space station. There is no orbiting satellites. So they send a shuttlecraft down to San Francisco. Matt, I right out of the gate, I was like, you're telling me your sensors aren't good enough to take a look at what's going on in San Francisco? I mean, like they send a shuttlecraft down and it's immediately attacked by U.S. aircraft from World War II. And then we cut to a prisoner who is being held by Nazis, and they have a prisoner who is being examined because of his strange uniform. And we see that it is Captain Archer, and one of the Nazis examining him is clearly a gray-skinned alien. With red eyes. With red eyes. So right out of the gate, this is Manny Cotto's first couple of episodes at the helm, and he has to write the show 
out of this corner. Matt, I told you a few minutes ago, after you read the Wikipedia description, I said, I will revisit something. I will, I'm going to withhold a comment. Well, I'm going to share that comment now. I think that if this episode had originally broadcast and had just been an hour of the text from Wikipedia appearing on a black screen for an hour, it would have been as good an episode. Oh, Sean, because so so this, harsh. this is the biggest ball of nothing. It is, it is okay. r- such messy writing and it's not because Manny Cotto can't write. It's because I don't know about you. As I was watching this, I didn't believe that anybody on screen cared about any of this other than the guest stars, because the guest stars come in with a, Oh, you want me to do this job? Okay. I'll do this job. I didn't get a sense that Bacula cared about any of this. I didn't get a sense that the guy who played Silic cared about any of this. I didn't care. I didn't think that the guy who played the, the time travel overlord, what's his name? The, um, from the, from the timeline defense squad, whatever. I can't even think of his name. Daniels. I didn't think he cared. I felt like that's harsh. The scenes where it's focused on why the time travel is happening and why the timeline is changing and how they will fix the timeline. None of that makes any sense. There's not okay. a shred okay. of that that makes any sense. <laughs> okay. It, I, this was labor say, for me. This was really rough. This was a rough couple okay. of episodes for me. So what, what what's horrible here, Sean, is you're putting me in the role of having to be the defender here because yeah. I am going to, let me put it this way. I didn't like these episodes. Spoiler for the next episode of Trek and Time. I didn't like either of these. They're not good. Not great. And I'm going to bag on some of it, but at the same time, I feel like I have to defend it a little bit because I think the comment you just made about like Bacala and all those, all those other actors is a little unfair. I feel like they did a noble job with what they were given. It wasn't, I, I never got the sense that Bacala was phoning it in. Not once. I didn't get that feeling at all. He was working with a bad concept that clearly just, it was, it was like what we talked about last time where they were just making this episode, which was just a, a shoot up. It was just like nonstop action, nonstop plot, but there was nothing, there was no heart there. There was no deeper exploration of really anything meaningful there. And then the stuff they did talk about all the techno babble was just like, really guys. And it was like bad, but, but this is where I'm going to defend it a little bit. I thought the action sequences were pretty good i thought some of the some of the tension moments they built up were pretty good for what they were it was it wasn't their fault with what they ended up with it it really was the outgoing showrunners basically taking a giant dump on a on the writing room table and then saying see you guys and walk out the door and then them going ah crap we have to deal with this (laughs) so it's like yeah (laughs) yes that that pun was intended (laughs) The, um, it, it, it just, it's, I, I, that's part of why I want to defend them. It feels like it was, I, I don't want to bag on what Manny Cotto. I don't want to bag on the mm-hmm. actors. It was, they had a crap sandwich they had to deal with and they did the best they could, but I am with you on at the end of the day, at the end of finishing this first episode, I was like, I could have just, I, I feel like I just ate like popcorn. Like it was just like. Mm-hmm. A whole bunch of nothing just happened. I, it just washed over me and there was nothing to take away from it. And one of my first notes, <laughs> this is just ties back to what my pale ghost comment that I read where he was like, I remember three of the 24 episodes. I'm in, the, I'm in the same boat for me. When I think of enterprise, the first thing that clicks into mind is pretty much any of the episodes from season three. Yeah. That we just finished. It's like, that is my memory of enterprise and then there's a handful of episodes from the season we're about to go through and on this specific one my note was i blocked so much of this episode out the suliban yeah. question mark exclamation mark i forgot completely forgot that the suliban were even in this episode it, it's it was mind-boggling like how how much they had to do how many contortions and backflips they had to do to get themselves out of that horrible corner they were in Mm -hmm. and they did an admirable job trying to do it 
and I don't know, I, I feel like I have to say, this is like a huge spoiler for the whole thing, but like it came across as Manny Cotto basically saying, we have to just kill the stupid time war. Yeah. We have to get this, we have to get it done, put a nail in it, make sure it can never come back. It's yeah. done, yeah. done, yeah. done. And so they tried to come up with a sequence of events where they could basically put a nail in the coffin of the stupid temporal war that goes all the way back to episode one of the entire series. And I'm glad they did that. But the way they did it makes zero sense. Yeah. It doesn't hold to any of the temporal Cold War stuff we've seen before. It doesn't hold to any kind of time travel common sense that they've even established. And I've brought up before, Sean has written a time travel book. <laughs> he's like, yeah. he's, he's, he's ventured into the territory of time travel is fantasy and you can do whatever you want with it. You just have to establish the rules yeah. and then live by those rules. Yeah. Enterprise has never lived by any kind of Bible for their time travel. It's yeah. whatever's convenient at the moment. And this episode is incredibly guilty of just like, screw it. We're just going to basically make this blanket statement of if we succeed at what we're trying to do, it will undo everything. Yeah. And that makes no sense. And Archer makes that one comment when that comes up of like, he basically is like, yeah, it's confusing. Who cares? And yeah. they kind of go on. And yeah. It was like, no, 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 no. We, no, no, no. This is Star Trek. You don't hand wave that stuff. You try to explain it a bit, but they were all in that pew, pew, pew mode. Yeah. So it was, for me, I'm agreeing with you that this is a hot mess, but I was admiring how, m <laughs> I was, and I was, I admired how much effort they put into trying to get them out of the, themselves out of this corner. Yeah. And it was clear as day that they were trying to put a nail in this to fix it. And then they could just move forward with what their new vision was. And so for that, I, I admire what they did. There are a couple of moments that for me stood out as being like practically feeling the director going like, okay, let's go. Yeah, that's fine. That's good enough. <laughs> yeah. Like it yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's go, go, go. where, that's where my problem with some of the acting like the, the, the flat response to what's going on felt very much like you're seeing some first and second takes as opposed to seeing the third and fourth. And mm -hmm. it just felt like a lot of this was clearly written with a, we have a certain budget for the year. We do not want to use up our budget on these two episodes. So, I'm so glad you brought that up. Lots of existing sets lots of existing costumes like you go to the paramount and some bad lot, special effects man and some bad special some effects but you horrible. walk into you walk into the paramount lot you say to a producer like i need some nazi uniforms they've got rooms full of nazi uniforms they've got rooms full of all the costumes that the extras are wearing the fact that they have aliens wearing nazi uniforms is like well we don't have to make the alien garb and I kept, I, every time they showed an alien wearing a Nazi uniform, I thought, why would the Nazis put on a Nazi? Why would the aliens put on a Nazi they uniform? They would not. And I, even little touches, like you want to talk about a tell about how important something is to pay attention to? What's the name of the alien race that Vosk is a part of? They never say it. They never bother giving it a name. And what bothers me most about that is right out of the gate. My first response to seeing them was, oh, they look like the Remens from Star Trek Next Generation Nemesis, which are the Romulan slave race. I thought it could have actually been interesting if they had been well, introduced as being that aspect of the Romulan culture. Like, throw that out as these are remnants and it's just like you remember that they're nefarious they had a thing on their forehead that reminded me of what was it the uh, kardashians yeah from deep space nine it looked like they were taking leftover latex molds and just like yeah compiling stuff they already had together to make a new alien yeah it's like here's the thing from the kardashians here's these things from this other alien and it was like we got a new guy yeah and they, um, the I, to, to call out the, the special effects for me the special effect shot that happened numerous times over these two episodes was of the white house where the columns, they would show that. The columns I was like, didn't even I was, have ridges on them there. Yeah. No, but it was like, it was clearly somebody in Photoshop just took, you know, a white house, they cut it out, put a generic sky backdrop behind it. It was like the most low rent special effects shot you've ever seen. I could make that in probably about 15 minutes. No joke. And it was like, 
when that came up every time, it was kind of like, oh, they clearly had no budget yeah. for this. <laughs> they yeah. were trying to save a lot of money. Yeah. So you end up with an episode. This it was for me, this was reminiscent of the Nazi episode from the original series. The third season of the original series where the budget from year one to year two was cut in half. And then mm -hmm. year two to year three was cut in half again. So on year three of the original series, they were like, what standing sets can we use? I know we'll find mm -hmm. a planet where they live like Greeks or Romans, or it looks like 20th century earth, or it's world war two, or it's the old West, or like literally just throwing out any place where they could be like, we've got existing costumes. We've got existing sets. We don't have to build anything. We don't have to do anything. We can just do all of this, or we're just going to stay on the ship. They're just going to be constantly running around on the ship. There's not going to be any new planets. There's not going to be any new aliens. We're just going to reuse what we have. This felt like that to me. This felt like cost cutting on display. And the story for this episode, you end up with Archer has been captured. He's on the East Coast. Somehow Daniels has timey wimey him to Earth, but mm -hmm. not onto the Enterprise. Why? Like, mm -hmm. Daniels has timey wimey from the explosion of the Zindi weapon. Archer is first alive and on Earth, and he could have therefore put him on the Enterprise. So what happened there? Why, why that decision? And then the Enterprise has separately gone to Earth and finds San Francisco is not the San Francisco they expected. And then surprise, surprise, they find out they're in World War II era Earth. A very nice scene where to Paul seems to be on the verge of debating whether or not they've actually traveled through time and trip kind of gets into her face. And then later on, he corrects himself and he says to her, that was inappropriate. I am sorry. I actually really liked that mm -hmm. connective thread. I would have appreciated a little bit more of a demonstration that to Paul wasn't actually debating time travel. Mm hmm. I think at this point for them to hold on to that little nugget of Vulcans don't believe in time travel, like she's done it herself. I mean, like at this point, yep. like yep. why would anybody throw that out there as a nugget? But the enterprise now has to figure out what is going on and they end up finding Daniels who is a mess of scars and flocks and examining him says his body is aged in different ways at different times. And so he's being torn apart basically by time, like something has happened. And all of this has the, it, for me, it has the look of a magic trick. Like why well, you think something is happening, but it's not actually happening. Else. It's not actually happening. Yep. I'm left with, what would, what would have happened to Daniels to do that to him? Why was he not able to, if he's able to move Archer literally from the weapon to earth and back in time, why can't he just put him on the enterprise? How does the enterprise not recognize that they've traveled through time? There's zero time travel experience. Like, and we've seen it a number of different ways through Star Trek of what time travel feels like to a crew going through it. And it has been demonstrated as being physically impactful, mentally discombobulating. This crew literally has no idea that this has happened. So I'm, I'm already struggling with some of the details that they're laying out, but then Daniel shows up and lays out this argument that the cold war, the temporal cold war has turned hot perspective of somebody in the future, the cold war that he's describing as having turned hot would have already always already been, hot. been hot. It doesn't yep. make any sense to say, well, this people are going yeah. back in time and changing the timeline now. Like that, like what? Like, yeah, th <laughs> this, this is, this is what I was talking about, about the, the very hand wavy yeah. stuff about time travel. They basically broke what time travel, tra time travel could work in, in a fantasy. Mm -hmm of what they've established, but it's not even that, that bothers me so much. It's, it's more of a, I don't know. It's, I guess it is that that's bothered me. It's, yeah. it's the fact that they've, they've set up standards for how time travel is supposed to work inside Star Trek. Yeah. 
and they just completely ignore all of it. And when you, it's kind of like I, when I was watching this, I was thinking about the about nuclear war. How in the world we currently live in, there are nuclear warheads all over the planet, and we could basically obliterate the planet thousands of times over if we get in a nuclear war. Mm. And so everybody who has nuclear weapons is like, oh crap. We could just end all of humanity if we're not careful. And so it's like mutually assured destruction. Right. Nobody would, in the right mind would ever start an actual temporal war. Right. Because it would become instantly uh, the hottest mess of hottest messes. Yeah. Because the one upmanship would be never ending. Yeah. And and because of that, it would you you immediately recognize this is a non-starter. Yeah. So Vosk would not do what he's doing because it would be complete insane. He would basically dooming himself and his people and everything instantly if he starts a war. Yeah. Why would he do this? And the fact that he's this mustache crawling guy doing it's like there were so many reasons why this would not play out the way it is. And then on top of that, the whole well, time travel wouldn't work the way they're describing it working because it's so ludicrous what they're describing. It just yeah, it, it's bizarre. And like, I don't, also don't understand that not in this episode, but how like they sometimes in Star Trek and other shows will do this thing where like the change that happened in the past is going to ripple slowly to the future. It's yeah. like, that's not what, how, what, what? That, yeah, that, no, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the, the whole thing with the, with Vosk, um, like the cold war is turned hot. What is his goal? Like, he's gone back in time to a different planet than he's originally from. And he wants to get home. And like his, well, they did, they did, they did establish that he has like learned stuff and he has stuff that he knows how to do now that if he can get back to where he's from, he can instigate his whole master plan. And so that's like the thing that they've kind of established as to why they have to stop him here and now. Right. I'm not saying it makes complete logic, I, it, but it's like, yeah, but that it's, was, but it's left with like, but to find that like in world war two on earth with Nazis, it, like it, none it's, of that makes any sense, but I will say that I just wanted to say this about kill, killing Hitler. Hold on. Killing Hitler as a baby. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, why did you come to this point in history to stop Vosk when you could have stopped Vosk when he was born as a baby or before he was born? It's yeah. like, it didn't, it didn't make sense as to why this was the point in time you chose to fight Vosk. Yeah. There are so many, you have his entire lifespan and before yeah. that you could choose <laughs> to try to stop Vosk. One of the things that stood out for me about Vosk was Gwaltney, who's playing him. This goes back to like measurable amounts of visible amounts of effort in the episode. Gwaltney is the only one who's trying to do something interesting with this new type of alien. I like the way he spoke. I mm -hmm. like that his presence was almost like hyper mannered in the way he spoke and the way he conducted himself. But there was zero direction given to anybody else to emulate that. There was one guy who played one of his lieutenants who looked like he was picking up on Gwaltney's speaking pattern and was emulating mm -hmm. that. But everybody else was just like, I'm an alien. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, check me yeah. out. I'm an alien guy. And it was just very distracting. The introduction of the resistance in occupied New York, I will admit to the occupied aspect of portions of the Eastern coast of the United States. There is an alternate history fan in me that like, it, yes, the man in the high castle, the the Philip Dick story of the United States, which is broken between the Japanese and the and the Nazis, um, like alternate history stories have a hook and they are intriguing and done well can be very interesting. They have an aspect in this storyline where you see the map and you see their anticipated U.S. response to push back and. I found all of that more interesting than what was taking place on yep. camera and Gwaltney's approach to the political game of playing the lapdog while actually conducting his own research for his own reasons. And the Nazi general that he's working with is in the dark about what's actually occurring. 
I thought that was all well rendered, but in the Brooklyn scenes, the resistance, which is made up of basically just Italian mob mobsters yep. and people of color, like interesting decision there to not show, you know, like any other group that would have been pushing back against Nazis. And yet they didn't go the direction of showing collaboration with the Nazis. So again, it's like a one dimensional take on like, if Nazis mm -hmm. moved into New York and took it over, what would that look like? Be like, well, you'd have these groups that would be targeted pushing back. It again, might've added a very interesting layer to show some collaboration to yeah, show I agree. people who are like, the Nazis aren't coming after me. So what's the problem? So like that could have been a really interesting, weird twist, but the, the resistance fighters, how did you feel about how they were depicted and how they were used mm -hmm. in this first episode? We see the, the mob guys and we see the, the African-American woman who end up with Archer as a result of them raiding a convoy. So they inadvertently end up with Archer whom they shoot. Because mm -hmm. when you're, when you're attacking a military convoy, you always want to shoot the guys in handcuffs because they're clearly Nazis. Now, I couldn't understand why they would even shoot him, but they end up with him and they're questioning him. What did you think about how all of that was played out? Let me just read my note that I wrote. It's the very first note I wrote. Mm -hmm. Just when I thought it couldn't get weirder, stereotypical mobsters <laughs> is what I wrote. I did not like the depiction of any of this stuff, any of it. It felt untrue for the time. Yeah. It felt um, paint by numbers. It felt it wasn't a knock against the actors per se. It came across as the writing and the directing, which was probably the biggest problem. But for me, the mobsters just being that, yeah, come get me to see kind of almost like this, what you'd think a mobster would be like versus what would a mobster be like? <laughs> we have so many movies about the mob that you could reference and pull from as inspiration. And instead they went to that Saturday morning cartoon portrayal of mobsters and how they would behave, and yeah. how they would act. That part just rubbed me the wrong way. The movie, the rocketeer does a better job portraying. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. From that time period. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it's frustrating. It was frustrating to me that they kind of like just shanked that when they could have very easily done something just a little different and better. Yeah. It was, also described in my research, I discovered that there was some commentary around it being stunt casting because mm. the actress playing the, the woman that he meets and here's, I, I mean, you hate to say like, oh, you've got a woman character. It should be a romantic interest. Like mm -hmm. you hate to have that knee jerk response. But in this case, I felt like they were playing it with the subtext that Archer and she were interested in each other. Mm -hmm. And I actually wanted there to be a little bit more of that, like a little bit more of, you know, she's a strong woman. She has this commitment to her neighborhood. You know, there's at one point she mentions, you know, her husband is on the West coast in the military serving, serving on the West coast. But I still felt like there, there was a little bit of a tension there between the two of them. And I might've enjoyed seeing that play out a little bit differently. But the, her career at that point, she was a regular on another program. So she's a known actress playing this part. And then the two guys playing the mobsters, the main mobsters, they were both from a mob show at the time. So it becomes a little bit like on the nose with yes. them and their depiction yep. and the, the send up of what the resistance looks like is it falls again in the camp of undeveloped. Like we don't know what this network's goals are. Like, are they helping the community? One of the big things about how like organized crime, and this is true globally and historically factions of organized crime will end up providing support to communities because that is how they gain confidence from the community. So yep. here we have the resistance in New York city 
And yet we don't really get a sense of other than shooting Nazis occasionally, what are they doing? Are they providing? Like we see the scene, which is artistic and nice about the, the music, the Billie Holiday that is being played in the neighborhood being passed around so that the Nazis who've shut down access to colored person's music, this is a form of subtle resistance. So Mm -hmm. like that I thought was, was fine, but there is this, there are so many question marks around goals from every direction that I found it very hard to connect to the mob characters as anything other than cartoonish mob characters. Yep. It will ties back to the, the show is clearly the writing themselves out of the corner was also, let's just try to make this an action packed, just shoot them up for the episode to get people glued because people like action. That's mm-hmm. kind of what it felt like to me, which is why they probably were not taking time to explore emotional relationships and uh, the human side of this. It was, that was, that would, that would be <laughs> a completely different direction, <laughs> which would have been the better direction. So I can, un- I understand why they didn't, yeah. but at the same time, it, it, f- it felt like they had the, the seeds of what could have been a much more dramatic and interesting show to watch than what they gave us. For me, one of the highlights of the show was when they get the radio transmission from the communicator transmission from Archer. He's stolen some of the aliens communicators. He's able to use it to reach out to enterprise and he's able to be brought up out of a gunfight, which is, I mean, again, an old Star Trek trope of the guys jump around the corner and they're ready to bang, bang, bang. And the transporter makes it not happen. Although We also had a death in the previous episode, which was the result of somebody getting shot mid transport and it still killed them. So again, little inconsistency there, but when Archer returns to the enterprise, there's a little bit of over-directing in that scene when Archer arrives on the bridge and every single person on the bridge is given a close up to show them looking up and going, (gasps) and yeah, like, okay, we didn't need to see every single person respond, but the one that stood out for me as th- the actor who was making the most out of not even having a line of dialogue was yeah. Jolene Blaylock as to Paul standing there with her eyes so wide. And yes. it looked like she was internally About fighting the urge to cry and the urge to grab him and hug him. And I thought yes. that that was for me that scene stood out as like, wow, they've really like, they really figured out the, the crux of their relationship, how she views him and where she is in her own story. She's now in this new terrain of having all these emotions really close to the surface. And she's struggling with that mightily. So that acting in that moment, I felt like Jolene Blaylock remembered where her character was. Even if nobody else like was ever saying well, to her, once like, again, don't forget, we say that she's the best. Yeah. She's terrific. <laughs> she's, the best. she's terrific in this. Yeah. So like yeah. that for me was, that for me was a scene that I was just like, this works very nicely. And then it's followed immediately by having to go have a ridiculous conversation with Daniels in the sick bay who he, again, he's not given a lot of good material to work with, but the, the, the bad depiction of like, I'm an old man and a young man and I'm dying and the, the heavy breathing and the gasping and the one blind eye and like all of it just like, mm-hmm. Oh my God, there's so much happening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, like for me, there was that, that nugget around uh, to Paul and her relationship. I- and there was also the, the care, the, the woman on in Brooklyn that stood out. I'm wondering from you, what were some of the things that stood out for you? Is like, this is good. This is okay. For me, it was the scene you just talked about. It was that moment on the, where every character on the bridge and Jolene's uh, portrayal there was fantastic. That's probably it, <laughs> to be honest. But again, to be the defender, <laughs> a little bit, to put on my defender hat, go back to the original series. And man, the performances were over the top. And man, was it ham fisted at times. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. man, did this episode, did this episode lean into some of that? So it it's did. like, yeah. We're looking at this from a modern point of view on this specific episode, which I think things have evolved and matured over the past couple decades for filmmaking on television. So 
we're getting better stuff now than we were then. But at the same time, I, d I feel like it's a little unfair to kind of like hammer that home when the original series did stuff that was just as ham fisted, just as on the nose as what this was. And people adore that show. So I just kind of want to kind of be the defender of for what it was trying to do. I think it did it. It's like they were trying to be that Saturday morning cartoon to a large extent is what I'm t reading this as. And that's kind of what they gave us. So we may not agree with the choice they made, but what the choice they made to do, I think it did somewhat succeed. I agree with what you're saying. I disagree in a couple of subtle ways. One of which is we are closer to where enterprise was being made mm -hmm. than where enterprise, than how close enterprise was to the yeah, original yeah, series. Yeah. More time yes. had passed. The style of television acting had changed dramatically. Most television actors at that time had come out of stage work. So mm -hmm. there was a very different model of acting dominating television in the late 60s, early 70s than there is in the early 2000s or now. And so I think that but that's you you are not off base by saying right. like, there's some ham fisted acting going on in the original series and that's just what they're doing here. Like, yeah, I get it. I'm also talking about the storytelling though. I'm talking yeah. about like the whole idea of what they were doing. Yeah. Like you brought it up, like in the original series, it was like, uh, it's the Greeks. Like, we're going to be here in Greece and we're going to be doing this stuff because it's cheap and easy that this episode has harkens back to that it mentality. Does. And so you could make the argument that they're trying to get back to the roots of the original show. And so in that regard, you could say they're trying to get closer to the original series because this is supposed to take place shortly before the original series. So eh, <laughs> you could kind of make that argument. Yeah, I get I get okay. that. But I think that yeah. part of the difficulty is what makes it look most like that are mm -hmm. what feels like rushed trying to get out of the room as quickly as possible. Yes. And so Agreed. there's there is television that harkens back to in different era there is television that is intended to be popcorn television there is television that is supposed to be like actiony saturday morning cartoon fun mm -hmm. and then there is a program that seemed to have a, a couple of notches above that bar take a big step backward simply because of cost cutting and rushing it to get out of a bad writing situation. So I think that I do not place blame on literally anybody who was involved in the direct production of this episode. Mm -hmm. It's just, they, I, it, I keep going back to, it feels like they were written into a corner and they did the best thing they could to get out of it. Right. Right. So we will revisit this setup with the conclusion next week, we'll be talking about Stormfront Part Two. Before we sign off, though, Matt, what do you have coming up on your other channel that you wanted to talk about? Uh, there's a cool video that I think should be coming around the time of this episode about a material called Aerogel, which is like NASA kind of created kind of stuff, and it's really kind of science fiction kind of stuff where we can create, we can cool things without the need for any electricity. It's really, really neat. Um, it's a cool technology. So check that out. It's a cool technology. See what I did there? I see. <laughs> As for me, you can check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You can also go to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or your local bookstore. My books should all be available at all those locations. And if you'd like to support the show, please consider reviewing us. Review us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it is you listen. Or if you're on YouTube, you can leave a comment right there. If you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show. Click on the Become a Supporter button. It allows you to throw some coins at our heads. We appreciate the welts. Thank you so much. Supporting us directly will also open up out of time for you. You become an ensign, and in your feed, you will find occasionally our spinoff show in which we talk about anything, including Star Trek, sometimes the other Star Trek programs, out of order and without so much leaning into the context of the original broadcast. We'll also talk about other things like sometimes it's Lord of the Rings. Sometimes it's going to be Star Wars. Sometimes it's going to be video games or movies. We've touched on a lot of different things. We hope you'll be interested in checking that out. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening or watching. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.